If you are watching this video, you are probably a high school student going through the process of considering your college major and a career. Hi, my name is Gary Stocker, and I'm a medical laboratory scientist by training. And I want to take a few minutes to share with you what this career would be like for you. I'll share the education and training requirements, some examples of the work you can do, the money you could make, and the career opportunities that could come your way. Medical laboratory scientists are known by lots of names. Med techs, lab techs, lab technicians, clinical lab techs, clinical laboratory science techs, technicians, all those kind of names apply. But the career we're going to talk about today focuses on the laboratory. And the most common name and the name I'm going to use is a medical laboratory scientist. The work I do is for a specific set of hospitals in the St. Louis, Missouri area. You can see the names of these hospitals and some of their other business units on your screen. But the focus of this presentation is on the career. And in the medical laboratory, it is a hidden career. A medical laboratory scientist infrequently has direct patient contact. So it's really a hidden career. But as you'll hear me say many times during this video, 70% of all hospital decisions are based on laboratory results. And as I record this in 2022, there are hundreds if not thousands of medical laboratory job openings across the United States. When you look at the education piece, there are two components associated with it. One is an opportunity to be a medical laboratory scientist with a Bachelor of Science in Medical Laboratory Science, and it's offered through many colleges and hospitals throughout the country. There's also an associate degree option, a two-year option. It's more typically called a medical laboratory technician, but that's a minor detail. The career for medical laboratory scientists is mostly in hospital labs, although there are many opportunities in independent labs not associated with hospitals, in research labs, and with manufacturers who make the equipment, supplies, and reagents used in medical laboratories. And as in almost all clinical healthcare roles, there's an opportunity for shift work to have some scheduling flexibility as you start and continue your career. I wanna add two basic routes to get to that Bachelor of Science degree. The first is something called the traditional route. It is three years of college with a degree declared as a medical laboratory scientist or in medical laboratory science. The first is a three plus one, with a declared degree in medical laboratory science, and then a nine to 12 month internship in a hospital associated with that college. That's the plus one part. The four plus one model is where you make the decision to get that BS in biology or chemistry or microbiology, maybe even public health, and then get the specific clinical internship. Just know that option exists. Let's talk about some of the clinical disciplines. And the first one is chemistry. And of course, it's the study of various compounds and elements as it relates to the human body. Some of the common tests are sodium and cholesterol, heart attack indicators like troponin, CPK, LDH, liver and kidney diseases, and others are typically performed on automated equipment. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Medical laboratory scientists monitor these complex these robotic analyzers for quality and consistency. And let's just take a minute to look at some of the analytes, some of the tests done in chemistry in medical laboratories. And I mentioned a couple of them. I'll let you read those on the right on your own. But the image at the top left that I've got circled shows the level of robotics and automation in a chemistry system. And you're seeing a model of an automated chemistry line that takes the blood specimens, processes them from receipt all the way through testing and storage. It is one of the most fascinating aspects of the medical laboratory and how robotics and science have been combined. And then let's look in the bottom left portion of this screen and just kind of a quick science lesson on the composition of whole blood. And if you look on the bottom, you can see about 30%, 40% of that tube is red blood cells. And you see the little white area that I've circled, that's where the platelets and the white blood cells are. And the top is the plasma, sometimes it's used as serum, where the chemistry analytes are done. 
And this just gives you a picture for what your blood specimens look like either now as patients or what you would work with in a medical laboratory. And the next clinical discipline that I want to talk about is hematology. And again, you can see I've highlighted this factor that 70% of all medical decisions are based on laboratory results. It can be the diagnosis of a disease or the therapeutic monitoring of a disease. Drugs used to treat, for example, antibiotic um, infections or even in some cases, viral infections. Hematology, by definition, is the study of blood, blood morphology, and blood diseases. And what you see on the screen is kind of some science that I want to share with you. And on the bottom left is, for the most part, a normal patient's peripheral blood smear. A normal patient's peripheral blood smear. The blue arrows on the left highlight some normal white blood cells. You can see the two cells in the middle have some segmentation of the nucleus. Those are called segmented white blood cells or segmented neutrophils. The one solid one in the top section of the slide is a normal lymphocyte. You can also see some abnormal white blood cells. And I've got one pointing to on the right, it's that long blue arrow, and it shows kind of an immature or premature white blood cells. And the white blood cells to the immediate left and lower left of that one are also premature white blood cells. They mean something that's beyond the scope of our discussion today, but that's the kind of technology, that's the kind of science that you would learn. And then you can see in the bottom right section of the slide, I have circled a normal red blood cell. You can see what's called the central pallor in the middle, surrounded by the red blood cell and the hemoglobin that's part of that. And in the bottom left, kind of a little purple dot I've circled is an example of a platelet. And now if you would, look at this slide that I showed you, which are typical white blood cells for the most part. And then look at the patient sample on the right-hand side. Take a second to compare the two. And you'll quickly notice some easy differences. There are a lot more white blood cells on the right side. These are from a very sick patient. You'll also notice that when you compare the size of many of those white blood cells, they are a lot bigger than the red blood cells. So look back and forth between the slide on the left, compare the slide of a normal white blood cell with a red blood cell next to it, and do the same on the right-hand side. You'll see many, if not many, but not all, of the white blood cells are much bigger. They are very, very, very immature white blood cells, not a good indicator for this patient. You'll also notice that on those big white blood cells that the nucleus, the darker stained area, is much bigger, it occupies a larger percentage of the cell, and just looks smoother. I'm not going to go into additional details, but just a quick comparison of some of the things you would learn as a medical laboratory scientist to know the difference between normal, it is mostly the case on the left-hand side, and abnormal, mostly the case on the right-hand side. And you'll see on this slide an example of an automated hematology analyzer, and the patient specimens go from the right side of the instrument all the way through to the left. Examples of testing include white blood cell counts, red blood cell counts, the size of cells, platelet counts, and much more. And in this particular analyzer, there's a slide made of the patient's blood, and you can see in the bottom left image what these cells look like on a computer screen. Let's talk about microbiology. And of course, from your science classes, I'm assuming that you're aware that microbiology is the study of microorganisms that includes not just bacteria, but fungus, parasites, and viruses. And the impact that medical laboratory scientists have in microbiology is they identify the microorganism causing the disease, like sore throats and wound infections, and in many cases, the antibiotics and the concentration of those antibiotics that will eliminate those infections. Here's an example of what a patient's microbiology specimen might look like in a modern medical laboratory. And you can see the agar plate on the left. You can see that it has been streaked very heavy in the bottom right section. And then in the middle at about two o'clock, you'll see two isolated colonies. One of the skills you're trained to do, you might have already done that in your high school science classes. In the middle is an example of something called a gram stain. It stains specimens to see what kind of bacteria are in there. And in this case, you can see some diplococci. You can also see some white blood cells that have been highlighted. 
And then in the top right is kind of an old fashioned way of doing it. But I wanted to show how, how medical laboratory scientists decide what drug, what antibiotic, if you will, and in what concentrations will kill bacteria. And so in this plate, it's called the Kirby Bauer plate, a isolated colony, like you see on the left-hand side, has been streaked onto the plate very heavily, and then discs with specific concentrations of antibiotics have been placed on the same Kirby Bauer plate. And you can see that there are areas of no growth around four of the five, and you can see that the bacteria grew all the way around. The cell looks like an E for erythromycin on the left-hand side. This is the concept about how antibiotics and their concentrations are chosen to kill a specific bacteria in a patient. I'm guessing that most, if not all, of you watching this video are aware of the different types of blood types. And you can see the eight basic types in the bottom right-hand portion. But what I wanted to point out on this slide was the different types of tasks a medical laboratory scientist might do in a typical blood bank, sometimes called transfusion services. In addition to doing blood types, and that's ABO and RH typing, blood bankers or medical laboratory scientists do types and cross matches, not just the blood type, but what donated unit of blood will be able to be safely transfused into a patient. They work with platelets, which are taken from platelet donors. In many cases, it's cancer patients. And fresh frozen plasma is kind of that top part of the blood that I showed you earlier in the presentation. And you can see an example of some of this on the right-hand side. Uh, in the far back on the images on the right-hand side is a unit of what's called packed red blood cells. That is the donation from a patient, and they have just left the red blood cells in the unit. And in the front section, that is the plasma that has components, many times clotting factors, that can be used to help patients with a variety of medical conditions. You can see some of the factors used in some of these other blood bank products uh, for trauma, for anemia, for thrombocytopenia, which is a low number of platelets, and for clotting factor deficiencies. Compensation, and this is actually changing as I record this in early 2022. Because the demand is so high for this skill, and the supply is not at all where it needs to be, these numbers are probably low, but I will share them with I will share them with you anyway. And that MLT, that Associate Degree Medical Laboratory Technician, is earning somewhere in the vicinity of about fifty thousand dollars a year. You can see the range that I have up there. That's for the Associate's Degree. You could be earning that two years after you graduate from high school. The Bachelor of Med Tech or Medical Laboratory Scientist is is about fifty-five to sixty thousand per year. This depends in part on the urban area, on the system, but that's kind of a general number you can use to analyze whether this is the kind of compensation you would be looking for along with the type of work you think you would enjoy and be good at. It's also important to note that as a clinical specialist in healthcare, you typically work off hours, not always eight to four, but evening shifts, night shifts, whatever time frame combinations are offered. And you know, an estimated four dollars per hour. A full-time employee works a little over two thousand hours a year, so you're looking at additional compensation in the vicinity of about eight thousand dollars per year for an evening or night shift kind of scenario. As I wrap up this overview of what a medical laboratory scientist does, I offer some images to show you what the work environment looks like. And in the top left is a robotic arm grabbing some patient specimens. Uh, in the top section is a medical laboratory scientist loading one of those automated robotic chemistry systems that I showed you earlier. The bottom left is a medical laboratory scientist working in a microbiology laboratory, actually looking at a video image of a plate with the patient specimens on there, and you can see a lot of individual colonies on that plate. And the bottom right is kind of an overview of a combined chemistry hematology operation in a modern medical laboratory. I'll post links in the description section of this video down below, but these are some of the videos that will help give you a good overview of what's going on in a medical laboratory and the kind of career it could offer you. If you have more questions about the career, the opportunity, the education, the training, go to mls2030.com, mls2030.com. My name is Gary Stocker, and thanks for watching.